You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 17, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Our presenter is Dr. Heather Doss. She's a medicine pediatrics resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So um, today we're going to be speaking about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, uh, also known as ABPA. So ABPA is a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity reaction in patients that have asthma or CF. It's seen more frequently in CF patients. They'll get inflammation of their lungs, bronchial obstruction, and mucoid impactions, and this can all lead to bronchiectasis, fibrosis, and eventually, eventually <coughs> respiratory <coughs> compromise. So aspergillus is an indoor and an outdoor mold. It grows best in warm, moist areas, such as potting soil, crawl spaces, and compost piles. It grows the best in the Midwest and the East Coast. And unfortunately, it likes 37 to 40 degrees Celsius temperature, so your lungs are a perfect medium for it to grow in. There is some different uh, statistics out there for the prevalence, but for the most part, I found that asthmatics uh, have it in 1 to 2 percent, and then it's seen in 7 to 15 percent of cystic fibrosis patients. And this is going to be seen mainly in adults, and if you do see it in a child, it's more likely to be a child with cystic fibrosis than an asthmatic. So the pathophysiology is uh, you have your aspergillus that enters the lungs. Uh, it has proteolytic enzymes that are going to activate your epithelial cells, and this will lead to cytokines being produced of IL-6 and IL-8, and this will eventually lead to neutrophil influx and bronchial damage, and you'll have sloughing of your epithelial cells. In the same instance, uh, it makes septated hyphae, which end up uh, adhering to your uh, bronchii and will activate your uh, T helper 2 cells. Uh, this is done mainly through HLA DR2 and DR5 uh, antigen presenting cells. And then this will lead to um, IL-5 being produced that causes eosinophilia and then IL-4 and IL-13 which will activate your B cells and leading to our antibody uh, production. So the clinical features is you're going to have a kid that has, or an adult that has asthma and cystic fibrosis, and they'll usually start having um, deterioration of symptoms. They can have recurrent episodes of bronchial obstruction, and then just some general signs of fever, malaise, uh, some might have hemoptysis. And if you see them coughing up brownish mucus plugs, this is definitely something you should think about ABPA in, but it's not necessary that they're coughing up these um, brownish plugs. So the main thing you'll see here is that this is not a very specific disease, and so it's just something you have to have in the back of your mind with these patients. So there are specific criteria for diagnosing this in asthma patients. First of all, they have to have asthma, and they'll usually have a deterioration. And then uh, you'll want to do a skin test on them, and you'll have an immediate reaction to aspergillus. They'll have precipitating IgG antibodies. Uh, total serum IgE greater than 1,000, and then they'll have specific uh, IgE and IgG antibodies to aspergillus. So the ones in blue are the criteria that you must have, and then the ones in black are criteria that you might also see, such as the eosinophilia, and then you may see or may not see chest x-ray and chest CT infiltrates and central bronchiectasis. Can I pause you for one second? Mm -hmm. This is a great simple question. And I would also know the diagnostic criteria are in CF. Yes. So, diagnostic. And CF, there is a little bit more controversy because these patients tend to be a little sicker and might already have some of these symptoms without having the disease. So the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation got together and came up with these criteria, which are similar to the um, asthma, but not quite as strict. So you'll have the acute or subacute deterioration, and then you'll have an IgE greater than 1,000, but some of these patients might be receiving corticosteroids, so your IgE might be lower. So if it's in the 200s to 500s, it's, uh, you should repeat your IgE in about one to three months, and preferably when they're off steroids. And then you can either have a 
skin test reactive, or you can have the IgE <coughs> antibody in the blood reactive to the aspergillus. And then here's just um, any one of these findings. So aspergillus uh, serum precipitants, uh, elevated specific IgG, uh, or chest x-ray or CT abnormalities that aren't being cleared by antibiotics. And because this is seen more prevalently in cystic fibrosis patients, it's actually recommended that from age six of years old and on that they should be screened for this with an IgE or once a year or any time that you have clinical suspicion. So some of your chest x-ray findings are prinkle infiltrates, which you'll see mainly in the upper lobes, uh, atelectasis, which you're actually getting from the mucus plugging, and then if it progresses, uh, bronchiectasis, which will be a central bronchiectasis. And below here, I just listed uh, some features of bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis, such as tram lines, which is from your thickened bronchial walls, parallel lines from ectatic bronchi, ring shadows from mucus filling, and then two face shadows and glove finger shadows are from uh, mucus plugging in the second and fourth bronchi for toothpaste and then um, anywhere for the blood finger. So here uh, with these big arrows, you can kind of see they have those ring shadows, which is from your mucus. And then here, if you look real closely, you can see those tram lines and that's from your thickened walls. And then right here and here you have your uh, finger and glove. So your CT chest findings, you're actually looking for sim similar things. Uh, it's just going to show up differently because it's a CT. So again, bronchial wall thickening, mucus plugging, atelectasis, um, ground glass, uh, and air trapping. So a lot, mainly you're looking for your bronchiectasis, which remember will be centrally. So here we have, um, with these arrows, uh, tubular. And then right here with this little one, you have the cystic bronchiectasis, so two different types of bronchiectasis. And then over here, uh, you're having your bilateral mucus plugging, and you can see these are full. And here's just a good picture of a ground glass opacity that you could have from here. <coughs> so once you diagnose them, you want to stage them. There are five stages, acute, remission, exacerbation, corticosteroid dependent, and fibrosis, which is your end-stage disease. So stages one and three are actually going to look the same. Um, they're going to have your fever and your cough. You'll have your very high levels of IgE, and then you can see pulmonary infiltrates. Two is remission, so you shouldn't really see any symptoms. Uh, you might have normal or elevated IgE, and then you shouldn't be seeing any infiltrates. Your corticosteroid dependent are these kids that have the persistent asthma, and they have to be on the corticosteroids constantly, and so they may have normal or elevated IgE, and then they may or may not have infiltrates. And fibrosis is kind of your no return endpoint where you'll have cyanosis and dyspnea, and uh, you'll see the cavitary lesions and the bronchiectasis on film. So our goals for treatment are going to be to eliminate our exacerbations and then try to eradicate the colonization. And we'll do this with systemic corticosteroids, uh, itraconazole, and then some of these patients will end up needing fiber optic bronchoscopy to remove the mucoid impactions. So for your systemic corticosteroids, this is going to be used in stage one and three, which is your acute and your exacerbation stages. Uh, you'll want to use 0.5 mg per kg per day for the first two weeks, and then you'll want to change this to every other day and then slowly taper over six to eight weeks. Your stage four is going to be your uh, steroid dependent, so they're going to be on steroids long term, and you're just going to want to give them the lowest dose you possibly can to keep their symptoms under control and their IgE at a reasonable level and continue to monitor their symptoms. When these people are diagnosed, you want to get an IgE at diagnosis, so you see where they're at, and then at four and eight weeks, and every eight weeks after that for a year to monitor how they're progressing. The itraconazole uh, is also added to these patients. Adults will get 200 milligrams three times a day for three days, and then go to 200 milligrams twice a day. And children will just be five milligrams uh, per kilogram every day, or this can be split to twice a day. And you'll want these patients on this for 16 weeks. And while they're on it, you need to monitor their LFTs. And different studies have shown that the reason this is added because it can decrease their exacerbations as well as decrease the amount of steroids that they need to take. 
Cystic fibrosis patients might need more medication, and so for them, your steroids are going to be 2 milligrams per kilogram per day for a week, and then reduce that to 1 milligram per kilogram for the next week, and then you'll be reducing on a taper that you see below here, so your taper is going to be 0.5 milligrams per kilogram on alternating days for three months, and then you can de decrease it further in the next three months. With these kids, you're actually going to follow their chest x-ray and their IgE, and so uh, for them, you'll actually be following one to two years, getting it every six months. And the reason you're following their IgE is to see if they're having relapse. And so if their IgE increases by twofold, then you're going to need to increase their steroid dose. So finally, in conclusion, uh, the big thing about this disease is it's very nonspecific. So it's something that you just constantly need to have in the back of your mind for your CF and asthma patients. And if you're having um, one of these patients that's having deterioration or chronic symptoms that you can't really explain and you can't make better, then think about doing um, the skin test or um, looking into them having uh, ABPA. And why it's so important is because the early diagnosis and treatment is key because most of these uh, people aren't picked up until they're late in the disease and then they're at the irreversible stage. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's very good. Um, the one thing I'll point out is that uh, nitrocarm is also giving you um, addition to steroids. Because it's always been uh, it's always been thought that this is more of an allergic reaction as opposed to a colonization. Mm -hmm. But may have done some research like lately that it's linked to nitrocarbazol as a potential treatment. Uh, but again, it's unclear if people are really mm -hmm. the mechanism there. One study I read thought that the mechanism might be that it interacts with the corticosteroids on the way that you break it down. So you end up actually having a higher dose then because it's not being broken down as fast. And so maybe it's really just that they're getting more <coughs> steroids then. People 50 reaction. Awesome. Thank you very much. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.